Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode three of the Film for Fans podcast, your home for movie news, reviews, and movie fan views. The podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I am your host, Ryan Dunlevy, and I am joined once again by the amazing Rob Dunham. I am amazing. I got to start coming up with some better descriptions for you. I mean, I'm cool with amazing. We need to stick with that. Yeah, I ran out of anything good to say there, so we just went with amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got a great show for you tonight. We're going to be talking about the pandemic's continued effect on the movie industry, why we love movies, a little bit of personal talk there, and underrated films that you might have missed. All this. And, of course, our watch list. So, Rob, let's get started with news, shall we? Let's. So, the first thing off the bat is Disney making a major pivot on their blockbuster release from Mulan. So, this is a fascinating story. Disney decided to basically scrap any plans whatsoever to uh, release Mulan in theaters in the U.S., and are moving to sell the movie essentially on their Disney Plus streaming service for $29.99 beginning September 4th, I believe. And so the story is they are not gonna put it in theaters. You can buy it for 30 bucks on Disney Plus if you have a subscription, and then you get to keep it on your Disney Plus subscription as long as you have one. So, Rob. Disney just giving up on a blockbuster release. What are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm really not sure what to think. I don't, I don't know how it's going to be a hugely successful decision for them because I don't see millions of people buying in at the $30 price point. Um, I Disney plus is in 4k. So that, that might be worthwhile for some people who have the ability to stream it that way. Um, and it would be less than the tickets to go to a movie for a family of four, if that's how you're looking at it. Um, but I know that most of the new releases that have been coming out uh, direct from theater to Vudu and other services have been between 15 and $20. So $30 is a bit uh, of a high price point, I think. Um, I think they're trying to make some money from it, and I just don't know how long it will succeed. and. I'm also curious about how long it will be um, in exclusivity that way that you can only get to it if you buy it um, and if they'll eventually release it to be streamed through the subscription that many people already have. Yeah, I think, I think that releasing it on Disney Plus, while it will certainly be a, a boom for their particular platform, I think it's certainly going to hurt the overall money that Mulan makes because you not only have to purchase Mulan, but you also have to have a Disney Plus subscription. So, I mean, the good thing for Disney is that they have a tremendous amount of millions. I think something like 60 million subscriptions or something along those lines. Maybe I've got that. Yeah, I think I saw an article today that said something like 60.5 million subscribers so far. So, I mean, that's, that's a pretty massive number, but that still means you have to have a subscription and then on top of your monthly subscription have to purchase the movie. So I, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard for me to see this as a business win. I wonder if they were just, you know, just kind of done with toying around with it, but it's just, it's strange to me because other studios have been perfectly fine backing up releases for a year or more. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's a curious decision. I wonder, I wonder how it's going to work out for them. I, I, I wonder if it'll have a ripple effect and if any other studios will see this and, and do the same thing. So I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. And I guess we'll see once Mulan debuts in September, uh, we'll see what the movie industry is looking like. Cause you know, I mean, by that time it's possible that actual movies will be in theaters. Um, so it, it's, this is definitely a risk. Okay, so we'll see what happens for Disney. But let's, let's talk about another movie that could potentially be affected by the pandemic. 
And uh, recently, Dennis Villanueva talked about what the pandemic is doing to his uh, December blockbuster release of Dune, the highly anticipated release of Dune. Um, and it's actually going to be two movies eventually. So um, Villanueva talked about the pandemic shutting down some extra reshoots because they had done most of the principal filming for the movie and were in a lot of post-production, but he wanted to go back and reshoot stuff, which is not a terribly uncommon thing for, for directors to do. However, the reshoots have now been halted because of the pandemic and possibly sometime later this month, he might be able to start reshooting some of the films. But one of the main things he says, is it's going to be an absolute sprint to try and get this movie ready for its December release time. Uh, Rob, what do you think about uh, Dune? Do you think Dune is going to get done in time? And what do you think about Villanueva's comments? Well, there's definitely a lot of work left to be done in uh, the post-production area, especially in a sci-fi movie like this where there's all kinds of effects and transitions and uh, cuts that you have to make can be very time consuming so it'll be interesting to see what happens also in the article he mentioned that not being able to be in the same room as his editor is causing a lot of issues and uh, when you have such a tight relationship with the person that you make movies with I'm I can understand why not being able to be with them would cause angst and make it more difficult to feel comfortable that you're producing something coherent and something that you are proud of. So I, I think it will be a rush and we'll see. I, I hope that the rush doesn't impact the quality. I yeah. mean, that's the only hope you can have. Yeah, I, I, thought, I also found it fascinating. He was talking about the editing process, trying to do distance editing. And even for him, he thought it wouldn't be that big of a deal until he actually had to do it. And I think that's one of the fascinating things that those of us who are fans don't really get that, you know, that behind the scenes look at, at the movie editing process that much. And so it was an interesting insight from him of how difficult it was to not be in the same room as his editors. Um, and so just the different, all the different decisions you have to make and trying to do that remotely apparently was a really big deal. I did think it was interesting that he called it a sprint because that still means he's gonna try and get it done for the release date. And so I thought that was interesting that the, the talk was not about postponing it, but about trying to finish it on time. But I agree with you. Villanueva is just a fantastic director, probably my second favorite director behind Christopher Nolan. And so I hope he gets to make the movie exactly how he wants it. I would hate for it not to come out um, and him not to be happy with it just to try and get it done on time. So hopefully um, shooting will go well. There won't be any further delays and we can all enjoy Dune in theaters in December. So uh, moving on to our third news item. This one is interesting. This one I just, uh, you brought this story to me today that we added in. And uh, Rob, why don't, you, why don't you lead out on this one? Tell us about uh, Walmart. So we've been talking about the drive-in industry and how a lot of people have been pivoting towards going to these drive-ins or movie theaters have started showing movies on the sides of their buildings and in parking lots. and. Uh, it was announced yesterday that Walmart is going to have drive-in movies, which I didn't see coming. And uh, <laughs> uh, over 160 different locations all across the country, uh, they released over 300 dates. Yesterday at 5 p.m., free tickets became available. And I checked before we came on the podcast, and they're all gone. Every single showing is sold out. The nearest one to us here in eastern Pennsylvania is out uh, near Pittsburgh. But still, uh, a whole bunch of different locations all across the country, and they're all gone already. I, I don't know the capacity. They said uh, whatever the parking lot could fill around the screen. So I, I guess it would vary from location to location. But uh, it's, I think it certainly speaks to how big a word of mouth the drive-in experience has generated that a company like Walmart ubiquitous here in the United States would jump into it too and that it would have such a 
positive and massive reception shows that it's something that people are certainly interested in. Yeah, I this kind of surprised me because I did not see Walmart being the one to jump into this. That really that really surprised me that Walmart was the one that jumped in with this. And apparently they're partnering with Trebecca to be able to pull this off. And I guess they came into partnership after Trebecca had some uh, some positive driving experiences. But the, the main question that this brings up to me is why have the regular theater industries not done this? Like your major chains, Regal, AMC, and some like none of them are doing this. Why was it why were they not the ones thinking of it? Why is it Walmart? Why is Walmart the one that's that's jumping into the fray with this? And we talked about some independent theaters and you know regular drive-ins doing their thing. I, it almost I wonder if we look back on this and we see this giant shift um, away from movie industries, kind of kind of like what you saw with Blockbuster when Netflix came out. It's how you know Blockbuster should have invented Netflix and didn't. I wonder if we look back on this and we see Walmart's entrance into the drive-in theaters in a similar way that we saw. Uh, look back and saw blockbusters failure with netflix i think you're seeing uh nothing but um a, like a corporate relations win here for walmart that you're looking public relations you're looking at um i think people have really honed in on the fact that movie going is a communal experience and it's not just about going to watch a movie for yourself a big part mm -hmm. of it is being around other people watching the movie and I think that we've seen that push through all kinds of different ads um, in all kinds of different areas that we're in this together idea with uh, combating this virus. And I think this is another way they're attempting to sway public sentiment and do something positive. Uh, and I, I think that it can only be a success for them when it comes to like their, their Q rating in the country. And, uh, it is, it is really encouraging. It's, it's easy to be cynical about that, but it is encouraging, I think, that that aspect of movie going has really been brought out through all of this, that it's about being together. It's not just about going by yourself to a movie and watching a movie by yourself and having no interaction. Yeah. Yeah, and, and releasing the, the tickets for free is, you know, obviously it's one of the reasons why it sold out so quickly, but I, I think it does show that there is a market, especially right now, there is a market for it. And we'll, maybe we'll see it on a broader scale soon. So, okay. Well, that's the news items for this week. Uh, let's move on to some discussion. And I wanted to start our discussion tonight and get a little personal. Um, since this is a relatively new podcast and some of our listeners may not be super familiar with us or familiar with our history with movies, I thought we'd take a moment and just kind of explain why we're doing this from the standpoint of fans. Uh, both you and I are huge movie fans and been so for a long time. So we thought we'd just talk about where that love of movies comes from for each of us. So Rob, why don't you start? Um, where did your love of movies come from and were there particular moments or particular times that stand out that kind of pushed you in that direction? I think it, for me, it's kind of a tiered process in that um, I grew up in a fairly strict family that my parents didn't allow me to watch a whole bunch of <laughs> movies above a certain rating. So I started out loving movies by um, loving older animated Disney classics and things like that and newer ones that would come out and um, Beauty and the Beast in the 90s and The Little Mermaid in the late 80s and those movies were key to the beginning of my being interested in movies and then when I got a little older and was able to start going out myself and watching more of the movies that I wanted to watch I just fell in love with the storytelling of movies and being able to be transported to another place by a movie and I love to this day the fact that you can sit down to watch a movie and think one thing is going to happen and have your expectations totally subverted and something magical happens that you didn't expect and in fact I'll be talking about that here shortly when we talk about um, some 
overlooked or under-recognized movies that have happened, one in particular that did that for me. And um, I, I'll just I, I'll just never get over that experience of seeing something new. I just, I love movies. I love thinking about them, talking about them. Came up with a 100-point rating system for them because I'm ridiculously obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I love movies. Yeah. Yeah, for me, for me, it was really, I, I can't remember a time when I didn't like movies. Uh, I remember even being, by the time I was in seventh grade, I was in a movie club in middle school, you know, and I were running around watching movies, talking about movies when I was in middle school. But I think the, there was a, a moment for me that really ramped it up for a new level. Um, and now I'll say it was my freshman year of college when I was at, uh, I was at college, I got a job working at Regal Cinema in, in the town I was in college for. And working in the movie industry just took it to a whole new level for me, in part because I, w- I lived it, you know, working shifts and behind the concession stands, being in there smelling the popcorn. Um, we would even make like an atomic nuclear yellow popcorn that had just ridiculous amounts of butter and oil in it. It was so that unhealthy. Was it was ridiculous. <laughs> but even then, it's, it's you take your break, you grab some popcorn, you go sit and you watch 15 minutes of a movie. And we'd even, I'd even start like timing my breaks so that I could see like an hour's worth of the movie over a week. Um, but on top of that, we could go, we could go for free. So whenever we weren't working, we could show up for free. And so it just really, really got me into the cinema experience. It exposed me to movies that I probably wouldn't have gone to see had I not been able to get in for free and really broadened what I thought about with movies. Um, I'm getting visible signals as to what movies are popular, who's going to what. Um, I can still remember, this shows how old I am, but I, I still remember sitting in the theater uh, on my break watching scenes from Unbreakable and, and just like, no, I cannot wait to see this movie in, in full. Because you get this little snippet and you're just like, oh, I have to go see this. And, and, just, and just being immersed in the movie industry just grew my love for it. Um, and it's just, it's never stopped from that point on. I just am fascinated by the story creation process. Um, how they make things happen and how you take something that exists only in someone's mind and turn it into reality in that way. is just always fascinated me. I, I think you and I both could say that um, although it no longer exists because it went bankrupt, that um, movie pass, I think for both of us also was kind of a second wind or a renaissance when it came to how we felt about the movie going experience because having the barrier removed of needing to spend hundreds of dollars every month to go see all the movies you wanted to see. For me, it made it a much more exciting experience because I, I could just go, you know, I didn't have to worry about how I was going to pay for it. I could just go and continuing that on now with the theaters that are having subscription services. And I've had one of those has been really helpful as well. And especially if you're doing a movie podcast, the more movies you go see in the theater, the better. Absolutely. So that's, that's just a little bit about us and maybe we'll add some more personal things in from time to time, but that just kind of gives you a little bit of sense of where we're coming from and why we want to do this because our love for movies just abounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but let's, uh, my other discussion item for tonight that I want to talk to you about, I stumbled upon this, um, this article recently and it's, it's a couple months old, but it was written in the Atlantic and we'll link to it in the, in the details of the podcast. Um, but it was, it was basically an Atlantic writer. I think it was David Sims, if I'm remembering the name correctly. Um, during the quarantine, just spent his time watching movies that have been overlooked um, either overlooked because they were box office flops or overlooked because the critics panned them. So, um, as we all know, not all the critics and the box office does not always get it right when it comes to movies. There's some that for whatever reason, marketing or trailers weren't, weren't done well, or the critics just got it wrong. Um, movies just get overlooked. And so he, he put together a list of 30 movies that were overlooked. And so I thought we'd go through it and just pick out 
a couple of the ones that we resonated with that we thought were underrated um, from this list. And I love finding underrated movies. So I was, I was really fascinating to see. And this list has everything on it. Everything from like Babe, Pig in the City uh, oh, yeah. to uh, Tokyo Drift, Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift. So there's a wide variety of stuff on this list. It's really fascinating. So let's we'll start with you, Rob. What did you pick out and find on this list of underrated movies that possibly people haven't seen? So the first movie, and I would say that, um, I don't know if this list is just movies that people haven't seen as much as some of them are movies that just didn't weren't received well. Yeah. A lot of people may have seen. <laughs> yes, this is but, true. Um, like Army uh, or something. So the first one I saw on the list that stuck out to me was Constantine uh, mm. with Keanu Reeves from 2005. And to me, this movie is one of the better adaptations of a comic story. Um, but it just did not resonate with people, I think, because he was not, for one, he was not a huge superhero. For two, it was really just at the beginning of the, the Marvel revolution. And so there wasn't a whole lot of buzz around the idea of comic book movies and characters. Um, I know for a fact that Keanu Reeves has said, and inter interviews that if there was one character he could go back and do more of, it would be this character. And I think he fit the role very well. Um, he plays a, a demon hunter, essentially, that has to take care of and get rid of the evil that's trying to seep into the real world. Um, and Peter Stormare, I think, plays the best version of Satan in any movie I've seen mm. Satan be a part of. <laughs> He just, he, he plays the angel of light version of Satan that is shiny and appears friendly on the outside and is just absolutely terrifying and malevolent underneath and does it perfectly. And there's so much about this movie that is great, but I, like I said, I think it really suffered from the fact that it just came out in an era when comic book movies were not viewed in the same way and there just wasn't the place for people to engage with it. Yeah. 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 I can see that for sure. Uh, what else did you pick out? Uh, the other one that I saw on the list that really stuck out to me was cloud Atlas. And that's the movie I referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. um, a movie that subverted my expectations. And I went in thinking one thing and left just totally blown away. And for me, this movie is probably in my top 10, if not top five movies of all time. And I will readily admit that it is not for everyone. <laughs> so it's in my list, but it might not be in a whole lot of other people's lists. And I, this movie for sure suffered because it is an epic movie in every sense of the word, meaning it's long, drawn out. There are about eight storylines going on all at the same time. Uh, I don't think it's possible to follow this movie by only watching it one time. Yeah. And for a lot of people, I think the theater going experience is to watch a movie one time. I mean, you and I are not that way. We, we look at movies differently. But for someone who's only going just to be entertained, I don't feel like this is that kind of movie. And But I think there's a space for this kind of movie to be made. And um, I'm a big fan of music. Music is a huge driving part of the movie. It's, it's uh, woven all throughout the story. Uh, there's a specific part where the one song is played that I get chills every time I see it. And I think the acting is just phenomenal. There are um, Tom Hanks, Hugh Grant, Hugo Weaving, several other people play like, they each play like three or four to five different characters and they're almost unrecognizable at times. The, the scope and scale of the project honestly is massive. Mm. And I, I, wonder, I, I wonder looking at it what they think. Like, what do the actors think about how this movie was received? Because I, I would argue that for most of them, it may have been one of the most challenging acting experiences of their entire career. And it's just not the kind of movie that people leave gushing about. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not a blockbuster. It's not you go and have your hour and a half of entertainment and then leave. The movie is two hours and 52 minutes long, <laughs> which is almost... <laughs> Twice as long as most people like to sit in the theater for. <laughs> yeah. But what, I, I'm curious about what you, your thoughts are on the movie. I think, yeah, I, I actually do like it. Um, it's, it suffers from the fact that it's so complex 
And it's hard, it's hard to make something that complex accessible to large amounts of people. I think it suffers a little bit. I want to say it's not exactly the same thing, but a little bit similar to kind of what uh, Zack Snyder experienced with Watchmen mm. in terms of the expectation versus what was delivered. Um, and it's just, it's really, it was always going to be really, really difficult to pull it off well. But I actually, I've been very entertained by it. Like you said, the acting performances are great. Um, the various storylines are captivating and interesting. It does suffer at times from not, you know, it being difficult to follow in terms of the jumping back and forth. Um, but the, the settings are excellent. The scenery is very good. Um, there's lots of poignant moments in it. And so I do, I also think it's good. So what, what did you see on the list that caught your eye? So I picked out three that a lot of people probably didn't see. Um, but I really, really am a fan of these three movies. So the first one I picked was Dread. So Dread was a 2012 follow-up to the, the, I think it was 1997 Sylvester Stallone uh, action movie, Judge Dread, which was quite cartoonish and outlandish and kind of awesome. Um, but this one was a more serious fare. Uh, Carl Urban, Olivia Thirlby, a, a lot of it takes place in a specific building when they're hunting and they're searching um, it's, it's kind of future, a slightly apocalyptic future type stuff. And they're, these two cops are, are going through a building trying to track down people. Um, but it's really well done. And it's, it's really um, captivating from an energy standpoint. Like when you have a small setting and a small scenery, to be able to craft a movie that's engaging is sometimes difficult. And I think the performances, both from... Carl Urban and Olivia Thoroughby were really, really good. And I think actually Olivia Thoroughby is, is highly underrated as an actress. She hasn't been in a ton of stuff, but everything I've seen her in has been fantastic. So but Carl Urban somehow manages to pull off a great acting performance where you never see his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So it was, it was underrated as an action movie. Um, another one I picked out was Premium Rush. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt uh, action movie uh, about bike messengers in Manhattan. And so what's cool about this movie is it all takes place in like a three hour time window. I think it's like three or four hour time window. So that right there creates a sense of energy and a sense of momentum throughout the whole movie because you know the time frame is so short. So every little moment matters and every little moment counts. So I thought it was, I thought it was well cut. I thought it was well edited. Um, it's very compelling. It's, it's, a, it's a good back and forth. There's, there's almost, there's almost a, uh, a cartoonish aspect to it as well, um, both from Michael Shannon's bad guy character and, uh, and from Joseph Gordon-Levitt. But the humor is there. The humor is fun. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's a different take. Um, you don't see a lot of movies about bike messengers. And so I was, this might be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. It's true. It kind of, it kind of harkens back. I don't know if you ever saw the, uh, the old TV series, um, uh, dark angel with just mm. all cause they were all bike messengers in that one. So it brought back a little vibes from dark angel. <laughs> uh, but the third one I picked out was sunshine. Now this one was a real indie release in terms of, you know, it's popularity it has Cillian Murphy and a bunch of, at the time, relatively unknown cast members. Um, but it's a, it was written by Alex Garland, who actually also did Dread too. And hmm. Alex Garland is one of my favorite director writers. He's so good at almost everything he's in is fantastic. He does fantastic, but he wrote this one and it is interesting because it's a slower driven movie. It's, it's about, um, this crew that's going to is traveling in a spaceship um, in an attempt to revive uh, a dying star, a dying sun, to try and revive it. And the the shots and the cinematography are fantastic. This is one of the first ones that this is right about the time where the switchover between like DVD and Blu-ray was happening. And so this is one of the first movies that are like, I have to have this on Blu-ray because I have to see this in a higher definition format. Uh, so this was one of the first Blu-rays I had. 
And it's just, it's not for everybody because it's a slower paced sci-fi movie and a lot of sci-fi movies tend to be more action oriented, but it has a really fascinating journey. It's a, it's a journey movie, it's really fascinating. Did you see this one? I have not seen this one yet, but it's gonna be on my list for this week. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. So, all right, so let's, uh, let's jump into the watch list. And so, uh, I, so we decided to kind of switch the format around a little bit when it comes to the watch list. And instead of each having a few movies that we've seen and talk about, focus in on a couple of movies and just really discuss them in a little more detail, maybe look at each movie with uh, a different angle, maybe something that isn't obviously apparent or something unique about the movie that we saw. So uh, I know the first movie was one that you had seen action movie post-apocalyptic setting. And uh, what was that movie, Ryan? Oh, that was Mad Max Fury Road, Black and Chrome edition. Mm. Yes. Solid movie. Yeah, this is, this was interesting because this was a special edition released from George Miller, um, who actually wanted the, his original idea was to have the film in, in, in this setting. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if uh, black and white would have played super well in, in a theatrical release. We've seen it a few times over the years, um, but it's, it's used really sparingly, and almost always there's some aspect of color introduced in the movie throughout. You think, uh, the Sin City movies, for instance, mm -hmm. which were kind of like graphic novels, but still had those flashes of color in there. So it's very rare that we see a straight black and white um, movie. Think about a uh, movie like The Artist. These things, that they just they don't come around very often. Um, it's just not a super, super widespread medium. So what do you think about the use of black and white? I know you've seen the movie in regular color and in black and white now so first did you see any difference in how it made you feel uh when you saw it in black and white do you think that releasing it in black and white might have been a better choice uh what do you think um i i have to admit a slight bias in that i tend to not necessarily love black and white movies in and of themselves um I get where he, where George Miller, the director, was coming from, was saying, "Hey, it'd been cool if I'd have shot the movie if the movie had been in this to begin with." Um, I was reading about it a little bit, and he was basically saying, "I want to do it in black and white, but basically, you can't do a blockbuster movie in black and white. It's more reserved for art house and indie releases." Um, but I think it was fascinating because I was curious to see how it went because the original cut was so much about the color. And so I was concerned that it would really take away from the movie. And I will say I didn't like the, the Black and Chrome edition quite as much. However, it, it, was, it is worth watching because it really does shift your focus. It shifts your focus onto the characters and away from the setting and the scenery. So you do get the opportunity to focus in a little bit more on what is happening and on the specific character interactions, because you're less distracted by how crazy the scenery and the setting is. Now, I would say that the craziness of the scenery and setting really amplifies the pace of the movie, because um, this is one of the best action movies of the last decade. Um, so this movie was just fantastic from the word go. But I do think it shifts focus on it. It's kind of like when you saw, if you saw Avatar, when it came out originally in 2D versus 3D. Mm. In 3D, he was intentionally shifting your focus onto specific elements of the screen. So I think you get that a little bit of that effect when you're watching the black and chrome edition, as since you're not distracted as much by the colors and the vibrancy of the scenery, you focus more on the characters. I think black and white, one thing that it can be really effective at is, uh, the use of light and shadow. Mm, yeah. When you're when you're when you shift to black and white, can really just change the overall tenor of a movie, and uh, it can, in my opinion, emotionally impact your emotional investment or feelings about the movie, because, like you said, you are focused on 
different aspects of things, tying it to a more recent movie that we saw, The Lighthouse, um, which was also in black and white. That's the same kind of thing that the shadow and use of light really changed how you looked at the characters and shifted your perspective and almost made them seem larger than life in certain moments. And I feel like Mad Max accomplished the same kind of thing throughout the scenes because it is a very character driven movie. But when you're in the vast wasteland and you've got all the desert color and everything going on, it's easy to kind of just focus on the world instead of the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think making it black and white kind of shifts that focus onto the actors and what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, another one that we both watched and I've seen many times because it's been one of my favorite movies of the last couple of years uh, is Jojo Rabbit directed by Taika Waititi. And uh, this movie has no earthly reason to be as good as it is because <laughs> if you came to me and said, we're going to make a movie about a 10 year old little boy. Okay. In Nazi Germany. Uh-huh. Who has Adolf Hitler as his imaginary friend. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time I heard this description and I just thought, what is even happening right now? And then I saw who was writing and directing it. And I thought, Oh, this is something is going to be good about this. This is going to be interesting. Um, so let me ask you, first of all, what your initial impressions are of the movie itself. Because to me, I thought it was uh, an incredible subversive comedy that just absolutely ripped apart so much of the hate and evil that was Nazi Germany, exposed it for the nonsense it was. I think the nonsense in general when we hit people against one another just because of who they are mm -hmm. yeah i will admit to when i originally saw it in theaters to be deeply skeptical that it was going to be good um because just seeing what they were trying to pull off i would say it's almost impossible to pull off a movie where hitler is your comic relief and yet it was so well done it was so well done. I mean, if you're threading the eye of the needle, and Watiti did it to perfection, to perfection, what he managed to pull off in this movie is stunning. Uh, if you have not seen this, you have to see it. There are so many different aspects of this movie that are right on point. It's, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it achieves so many things. And I normally do a um, a uh, year's best list, uh, top 10 movies of the year. And I actually didn't catch this one until after I made my list. Um, but this one would certainly have been on it. And I think the more I see it, the more I appreciate just what a fantastic movie it is. And we talked a little bit about YTD when we talked about the Thor movies last week. But mm -hmm. I mean, this is probably by far his best directorial move. Um, it's just incredible. When you say it's an accomplishment, what would you say is the, because to me, I, I certainly agree with you. I think it is an accomplishment. I think it's something you should be incredibly proud of. And what do you see as the biggest achievement within the movie itself? Like what is in the movie that sets it apart from other movies you've seen? So I had to think long and hard about this question because it accomplishes a number of things that were really difficult to pull off. But at the end of the day, I think despite all the cinema, cinematography and, and just the story challenges, I think the ability to show um, a 10 year old boy moving to a place of hatred of Jews to actually being an ally of a Jew. And over the course of this movie, watching him progress to where he's just being repeating all the hate that he's been told to actually developing a relationship with this Jewish girl that's hiding in his house. That was phenomenal. Basically, this idea of how we break down hatred between people through relationship and through getting to know somebody and actually finding out the different things you have in common. And to be, able to, to be able to weave that into the story 
And as you watch the transformation of this 10 year old boy through his relationship with this Jewish girl, was just really, really, really well done. I think for me, uh, the thing that stood out to me the most is I think there are so many movies that try and go for an easy grab when it comes to emotions, or there's a scene with music that tells you you're supposed to feel this emotion now. And I felt like throughout the whole movie, it was hilarious in many parts, but there were some parts in it that were just devastating. Mm. And they felt real. They didn't feel contrived or there wasn't a soundtrack underneath them that told them, told you you should be sad now. There, there's a moment with him and his mom that I don't want to give away that is honestly probably one of the most devastating emotional sequences I've seen in the movie because you don't see it coming until it happens. And you see it and it's a moment where your inner monologue goes, and no why <laughs> and to be able to have a moment like that in a movie that is predominantly a comedy to me that's the biggest accomplishment to be able to have both tones in the same movie but it doesn't feel like neither belong it feels like they're both supposed to be there so yeah. like you said there are just so many accomplishments in this movie that i i think it will be viewed as we move forward as as uh, maybe the capstone of his career, it'll it'll be viewed as a true achievement on his part for the rest of his career, without a doubt. Yeah. So if you have seen Jojo Rabbit, it's now out on HBO Max, um, or you can rent it through your normal channels. But it's it's absolutely worth a watch if you haven't seen it. All right. So let's wrap up with uh, what we're watching this coming week. So Rob, what are you watching this coming week? Well, tomorrow, if the weather cooperates, I'm going to go to the drive-in again. I got a season pass for the rest of the year, so nice. I might as well go use it. My parents live 10 minutes away, so I'm going to stay at their house, so it works out pretty, pretty nicely. Nice. And I think we're going, to, we're going to split screens. We're going to start out with Minions, and then we're going to watch Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. So, okay. you know, two movies that really go together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I also, I, I'm going to watch Cloud Atlas again this week because it's been a, a long time since I've seen it and I just want to watch it again and, and uh, the movie Sunshine that you mentioned I'm actually thinking about checking that out and there was another one on the list that is in my voodoo collection that I haven't watched yet because it was my brother's um, the movie Solaris was also mentioned on the list so I think I might watch Sunshine and Solaris two of the sci-fi movies on that list and look at them contrasting with each other maybe get some thoughts there how about you all right, so I am going to once again attempt to watch Uncut Gems, <laughs> which I continue to not. The it's white the, whale. Yes, it's the potent potables of my movie category. It's always there, but I never quite get to it. Um, so yeah, I we'll see. Uh, it's on my list. I hope I'll get to it this week, um, but who knows? Maybe on the list again next week. Um, At this point, I think you just need to come over to my house and we need to watch it together so that there's no reason for you to not see it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm going to check that out. I'm also going to check out Sunshine again. It's been a while since I've seen it. It's probably been a couple years since I watched it, so I really want to go back and watch that one again. And another one that came off that list is Black Hat. I kind of mm -hmm. had panned it when it came out. I wasn't that interested in it, but uh, I might check it out. Um, I, I have a hard time seeing Thor as a hacker, but yeah. <laughs> maybe it works. I don't know. So. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you for checking us out. Thank you for joining us on this week's podcast. Just remember, you can subscribe on all your major podcast channels, Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify. Um, and now you can also check out our YouTube channel, Film for Fans YouTube channel. Um, and visit filmforfans.com. Our website is up and launched. Uh, so we look forward to it, and we've got some more great stuff coming up for you in the weeks ahead. So thanks for checking us out, and have fun at the movies. Enjoy your atomic popcorn. <laughs>